All right, hit your buttons. Okay. So I'm Sarah Willitson. I'm an adult services librarian at Prescott Public Library. I want to welcome you to the second installment of this two-part workshop series on seed saving. If you missed the first workshop, it should be available on the Prescott Public Library YouTube channel shortly. Um, for the workshop today, there's going to be a question and answer sessions during and after the workshop, but you're also welcome to write your questions in the chat area of this Zoom meeting as the program progresses. Please keep your microphones muted during the program unless you're speaking. And finally, I want to thank the friends of the Prescott Public Library who provide funding for programs like this one. Our presenter today is a seed saver, writer, and educator based in Cornville, Arizona. He is co-founder of the Down Home Project, Garden City Seeds, Seed Trust, High Altitude Gardens, the Sawtooth Botanical Gardens, Seed School, and the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance. He is the author of the book, Basic Seed Saving, and is the former executive director of Native Seeds and Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance. He now oversees the patent-free seed campaign and teaches seed school whenever he is called. Please join me in welcoming Bill McDormand. Hello, everybody. Thank you. Um, I'm treating um, today's class like um, a video archive in a way. You know, th there's a lot of material. And so um, if you come to one of our live events or even our, you know, 10-week um, online event like we have um, that we're doing right now with Grain School, we try to have some interactive time we break into small groups we we even have hands on and we're not going to do that today and and i'm doing that so that you can go back and listen to this at your own leisure if you need to and you can stop it and you can do those sorts of things if you need to and um, that way the prescott library has a complete set i tried to get all the information in for what i thought would be a complete standalone um, basic seed saving course um, and I'm doing that out of a sense of responsibility. I think these are going to be the important things that um, places like libraries have. So I just want to kind of give you a heads up as to how I'm proceeding today. I'm just going to go through material. Um, uh, we've got three parts again today, um, advanced seed saving, breeding, and stewarding seeds. And after each section, they'll be 20, 25 minutes each. Um, we'll open it up for questions. And during that period, you're welcome to take a break or whatever. And so we, it won't be that intense, hopefully. And so I think I'll um, uh, get started here. Uh, hopefully this will work again the way it um, did before. So I want to view, play the slideshow. And... All right, so are you seeing just one slide come up? Or you're seeing both? Two of them, yes. Oh, we did that again. <laughs> I'm gonna try to get it so that it's right. Sorry about that. Let me share it differently. I, it depends on which screen I put it on. Let me... All right, let me put this up here. And let me share again. Okay, let's play again. Is that any better? It is. Okay, great. Um, let me, I think I, I started me in the wrong place. So sorry about that. I'm gonna step through these real quick. Easiest way for me to get back. You get a sneak preview of what's gonna come today. So you can memorize that thing. Anybody have a photographic memory? All right, this is where I wanna start. I'm gonna um, here at the beginning, just kind of go over a couple of concepts that I think are key to basic seed saving. These are the things I think that you would need to know um, to make this successful. Um, the seed saving itself is simple. All you have to do is find the seeds and save them. Every flowering plant produces seeds. 
you can just figure this stuff out on your own. And as one of my really smart students once said to me, Bill, all the seed saving information in the world is probably on the internet now anyway. So if you have a particular variety or a particular problem, you can probably Google up and find a rather technical, if you want it, solution to what your problems are. But what people don't talk about are the general concepts and the shortcuts and the things that will help you get through that process. So that's really what I'm going to try to do here again. And I'm going to here at the beginning remind you of some of the things that um, I think are worth saying twice. So um, last week I said, you know, that as far, if you look at the seed world itself, if you look at what mankind, humankind has done in the last 40 years as far as industrial agriculture, and, and um, moving toward industrial and monocropping and um, uh, emphasizing profit over diversity, we've lost a lot of the diversity in our farms and gardens. And that diversity is what we're gonna need. And nobody, in my opinion, is coming to save us. Nobody cares enough or has the funding um, or has a program that's going to be effective. It's just too disparate, too spread out, and needs too many people to make it work. And so this must be a grassroots movement. And I say that with all, all my heart. If we have more seed savers, we will have more diversity. That's biology. And nobody's going to get around those facts. And nobody can hire enough seed savers or enough um, uh, professors in institutions like our big gene banks to be able to do that. It's going to be up to us. And Dr. Carol Depe is one of the great examples of people who came out of that world. She taught um, genetics at Harvard for 25 years. And this is a quote from her in, out of her book, until recently, all gardeners and farmers saved their own seeds. And what this means is that if we're gonna do this, if we're gonna get millions of seed savers again, we're not, we don't have to invent this. This is what we used to have. We just need to model in some ways what we had in the early 1900s, probably in this country. And amateur kind plant breeding was the only kind of plant breeding there was. That was for 9,850 years, as uh, Dr. Bill Tracy at um, University of Wisconsin-Madison says, you know, points out. And while it may not be as up-to-date and as profitable, you know, a kind of breeding as we have today, it certainly was effective. It created the whole food system we have from edible plant, from non-edible wild plants to the things that we have today like carrot and lettuce and the modern wheats and all the different things that we have. And so, and it did that with millions of breeders and the goal, most importantly, the goal is being set by millions of people. And, and we, we, can, we know now that we can hack into this and make this work because, um, all of the rules that we were taught and I, you know, I came up as a gardener saying, well, you can't save seed from hybrids and you don't know what you're doing, Bill. There's inbred depression. There's isolation distance. It's a really complicated thing. If you want to go get your PhD in plant breeding and then you'll know what to do. Well, that's totally unnecessary for seed savers. It's necessary if you're gonna create a new uniform industrial agriculture, those rules are all really important. But the smaller the scale you make your agriculture, clear into your own backyard, the easier and the more diversity um, we can not only tolerate, but we can uh, create and we can enjoy. It becomes a big adventure. And, and we know that we've been kept from seed saving. And I think most American gardeners have been kept from it, millions of them. There's like um, uh, 65 million gardens being planted with 120 or 160 million Americans that are involved in gardening. It's the second um, most popular outdoor hobby in America or, or right up neck and neck with bird watching. All right, we're gardeners. We just don't save our seeds anymore, right? And a lot of that's because we think we need these rules for industrial agriculture um, uh, in order to do it. And that, as I said, that's nothing could be further from the truth. The smaller you, you make your scale, the easier it becomes to save seeds. You don't have to learn those die hybrid cross punit squares to save your own pea seeds in your own backyard, right? And no matter what happens genetically, if you make a mistake, you can still eat it. You know, you're still gardening. You know, saving seeds just becomes this whole superstructure above gardening. That's a great adventure that can bring great joy to your life and resilience to your community. 
And so, you know, after a number of years, you know, to put down the slope, how are we going to get millions of American gardeners to uh, start saving seeds again? Well, we're going to start with annual self-pollinating crops. And I talked about that last, last week. Self-pollinated. They, they receive their own pollen before the flowers even open. And they make their seeds in the same year. That means they're annuals. And so it's really easy. All you have to do is save the seeds. Grow the plant like we do anyway when we garden and save the seeds. And so there's a list of the ones that um, are the easiest. So if you want to get somebody in, um, involved in gardening, if you're part of a seed library, this is where you want to focus all your energy in the beginning of your seed library. Get everybody doing these things. Don't worry about um, problems with crossing. Don't worry about whether the seeds are good or not coming back in. Don't worry about all the other vegetables. Let people do that if they want. Let your seed library carry them. But focus your energy on getting as many people as possible to do these because you can trust more than any other things that you could do, these seeds to be good for the people that come back. And that's how we jumpstart these, these sessions. The Richmond Seed Library, Rebecca Newburn in California, the first seed library in a library did this. And now they've got their own uh, people that have been using the library for 10 years, teaching the courses on how to save the seeds for the crossers and the biennials and the more complicated vegetables, because they want them now in the library, but they all kind of came up together. That first year was all just tomatoes, actually. And so, you know, in 1992, I wrote a little book to kind of put this together. And I broke the book into a beginning, experienced, and expert. And what that meant was that Beginning, those are the things you can do right away. Everybody can do them and get your feet wet. Get, get used to this, pick one of those and get, get be successful at it. And then when you feel like you've got your wings a little bit, then move into those other things. And so this book is still available. It's $5, $5.95, I think. Um, you can get a, a Kindle version, I even um, online. And so um, that's still out there. And that book actually has everything you need to be an expert seed saver. That and practice and passion. You know, and so um, it's still around after 92. In fact, I sold 200 copies this week, went out to uh, institutions around the country that are using it in their program. So that's just use that as a resource if you can. And again, you can find it at RockyMountainSeeds.org. Um, maybe Renee will put the, the link in the chat there. And so what I'm going to do today is talk about plant breeding a little bit um, and, and demystify that because we're going to go into those, um, the expert ones and, and the, the harder ones a little bit, because I just kind of want to give you a picture for some of you that may want to do that if you're watching this video or whatever, um, what, what kind of an adventure um, um, is in front of you. And again, compared to the fears that I was brought up with about seed saving, I mean, it's all easy in some ways. And the more you learn, though, and the more you, you learn some of the tools and some of the genetic terms, the easier it is for you to get to what you really want. That's all that's really involved. And so um, plant breeding, big term. Actually, all it means is plant improvement. You're making things improve. And I, and I love to show this slide because Garten, this guy, was the first guy. And this was in like 1904 or something. I mean, or 1902 is when he had his seed company. Um, he was the first guy to figure out that there was a difference between self-pollinating plants and plants that outcrossed, which makes a huge difference if you're trying to improve plants, right? And so we... I mean, it's just like if you, that's 9,900 years <laughs> without even knowing that to try to breed, you know, things. And so that's just one of the little tricks as moderns that we've learned. And so what that means is that for us, if you're not into genetic engineering, it's really simple. Plant improvement means one thing. It means controlling pollen. Again, in the selfers, you don't have to because they're pollinating themselves. But for crossing, you can have a huge impact on populations by simply controlling the, poll the pollen. And so that gets into, you know, immediately you think, or you could get into the weeds with hand pollination of bean flowers. And we go into that in our seed schools and, and squashes are actually the easiest place to start because they're bigger flowers, right? You can actually see the parts you're working with. But the easiest way to control pollen is isolation. 
you know, is to, to plant crops so that you control the pollen by where they're planted. And so this is Monticello, this is Thomas Jefferson, and this is how he did it. He had gardens over on one side of his property, and then he had trees, and then he had isolation gardens on the other side. This is how everybody does it, really. If you've ever been into hand pollination, you know, for very much, unless you're a graduate student, you know, that, are at, that whose labor is being taken advantage of at a university, nobody pays for this stuff right? The easiest way to do it is have some time and space, lay things out right, and let nature do the um, pollination for you by planting correctly. And so I'll just, I'm planting some seeds for you there. If you've got a breeding project or you want to do something, this is uh, the easiest way to go forward. And so I, I threw this slide in, you know, this is going to be available, not only the um, the videos of this or the recording, but the, the PowerPoints themselves. And so you can go back and you can get these things and you, so you don't even have to take notes. Our, our thing at Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance is to give all our information away. We want everybody to learn whatever they can as quickly as they can. And we actually want you to become seed teachers right? And then you can use these things. We've got seed teachers all over. They start with our PowerPoints, give us credit, please. But then they quickly evolve into their own. Every, that's how it should work. And so, but if you need some of these slides to, when you're doing things um, to get started, then please, um, then please do so. So anyway, you're, here's a breeding roadmap. This comes out of um, the Organic Seed Alliance um, Introduction to on-farm plant breeding. You can uh, find a link to that at the uh, seedalliance.org website. It's free PDF, elegant, and uh, complete language about plant breeding. If you want to just, if you want to get your uh, uh, bachelor's in plant breeding um, overnight, just sit down and read that book. I mean, it's better than anything being taught at the universities, really, I think. Um, and then there are the other books that um, all have something really good in them that I've learned. And so you can get yourself up and running and relatively short order. Um, and so one of the things I want to talk about is the differences between selfers and crossers. And I'm not just talking about how they um, uh, receive pollen, which is the centralized part of it. And that crossers, it's harder to control the pollen because it's coming from somewhere else. And so if you isolate right, or there are a number of tricks where you can put um, masking tape over the flowers to keep them from opening up, they make tassel bags for corn, those sorts of things you can control pollen. But as I said before, nothing is as easy as just planting correctly in the beginning. So, but there's some things that, that um, start to fall out. So I wanna point out that there's no such thing as a perfectly selfing plant and a perfectly crossing plant that has to you know, cross with all of itself. Um, it's a continuum, never say never in nature. Those are just two extremes. And so if you'll picture a continuum in between them, right? And almost every plant falls on that continuum somewhere. And some are right in the middle. Some self-pollinate some, some cross-pollinate some. And then you have like the corns way out. On, and I put some examples of some really extreme examples at the bottom. But then you can start to draw some generalizations about selfers and crossers. And these are really interesting as you get into your breeding project. So, you know, outcrossing um, is prevented in selfers. Um, by design, by the structure of the flowers, lots of times. Um, you only get genes from one parent, usually. They're adapted to specific ecological niches. They don't have to change, right? They just get, get keep getting the same pollen year after year, and that's okay, right? Um, crossers, however, you get genes from two or more parents. You know, in the case of corn, you could get, you know, a hundred different fathers on one cob of corn, right? If the, each pollen grain came from somewhere else. Um, and by crossing, it allows them to adapt to changing environments more quickly. This is key because we want to adapt plants to wherever we are. And so in a sense, what's happening is you're rolling genetic dice. And the more you roll dice, the more um, numbers can come up that, that are genetic expressions that could actually fit where you are. And so cross, crossers are actually friends as far as quickly adapting to new environments, all right? And there's the, the list of those below. And then there's some further generalizations that you can start to draw between selfers and crossers. And again, I wanna point out that I, I put um, isolation distance and minimum number of plant numbers on there to kind of show you the progression of how they change, but they're not, you know, they're like squash, um, uh, doesn't need, 
you know, 500 feet necessarily. Um, that's just where it fell on the continuum. But it gives you, um, you need more isolation distance for squash than you say you need for peppers or for lettuce or for beans and so forth. So that kind of gives you an idea of how um, some of the popular vegetables fall out um, between selfing and crossing. And it shows you that as you get to be more of a crosser, you need more isolation distance. And something that we haven't really, I've mentioned, but I haven't really talked about is the minimum number of plants that you should probably have in your project in order to ensure vitality, viability. What happens is that if you have inbred depression, and that happens when you have too few plants, what it means really is you're, you're rolling too, many, uh, too few dice. And that allows recessive genes to link up in more cases. And when those recessives start to express themselves, the plants just aren't as vigorous. They don't get as tall. There's all sorts of things that start to happen. You can actually see it in your crops. And so if you could um, uh, seed to seed, is that the name of the book? Let me just look here again. Oh, The Seed Garden, which is the book that I um, showed you last week. Um, and I, it may come up in this show again, um, has isolation distances, not only for home projects, but if you even want to do an industrial project where there are industry standards for how much isolation you would have and with the minimum of plants that you would have. And, you know, I, for years, I was trying to find a way to, to get this concept of why you, you need a minimum number of plants to people. And so I came up with this little drawings and this may work for you, it may not. But um, the picture is of a globular cluster. So these are like um, clusters of stars that are actually rotate around our galaxy, right? They're like big masses and there's like a million stars in there. So just pretend for a second that that's all the genes in your variety, okay? So for, if you have a selfer on the left, like a uh, tomato, I always use Sasha's Altai tomatoes, one of my favorite tomatoes. And you save seeds from Sasha's, you're drawing a circle around all the genetics that are possible in Sasha's Altai as a variety. And look, you're getting almost all of them, right? So that's why every year you, you, you plant seeds and you save them. You know, the, you have, there are other forces working on the plant, epigenetic forces. And I'm going to talk about that in a second, but um, you're most likely to get the genes that you need. And that plant starts to adapt itself to where you are, but you are losing some probably. The, nobody's ever studied this or measured them, but that's the general idea of what happens. But if you're um, growing corn and you want to save a variety, say you've got golden bantam corn, you need to save seeds. When I first got started, they said, you need, need to save seeds, Bill, from a hundred different plants in order to get a viable population of corn. Okay, that would be like a hundred of these circles. And this gives you a picture of why you'd have to do that. Each individual plant may or may not have what you need or what is in or what will keep a plant vigorous. You know, so after a while, everybody started saying 200 plants from corn. When I got to Native Seed Search, they were going 500 varieties, but we have to do 500. And the truth is nobody knows, okay? How many do you need for a working population? I, you know, for me and what I've been working with and what I've seen, at least 500 probably over a long period of time. And that's, that's a problem if you're growing corn in your own backyard. But um, if you'll get in touch with it, if you really want to do corn in a small setting, get in touch with me because I've learned some tricks now that might be able to help you that go beyond just sharing seeds with your community or only growing 250 plants a year, putting that seed aside, growing the next 250 the next year, and then mixing that seed all back together. There are ways to do it. And one of the more difficult things to save seeds from are biennials. You know, the first big difficulty is that um, you don't get seeds that year. You plant something, it's not like a tomato or a pea or a bean. It just doesn't go to seed, right? So you plant your beets or your carrots, and at the end of the year, all you have is a beet or a carrot. And so, you know, it's like, oh, God, now what do I do? I mean, if you live in Prescott and you leave it in the ground, it may or may not survive the winter. Probably depends on how much snow you get or how, you know, if it gets below zero or there's all sorts of things involved. And so um, easy, I'm just going to give you a thumbnail shot of, of what you can do for both beets and carrots, because it's really interesting. 
um, pull them all up at the end of the year. And this is a, a picture of John Navazio and a project he did for Organic Seed Alliance around beets where they created a new beet variety. And they just pulled them all up in rows and laid them out. And then um, they got scorecards out and went down the rows and looked at the ones that they thought were the model of what they wanted to take on. And they would pull those beets out. And so they found two or 300 out of this whole field that were really good examples of what they were looking for. And then they did something really strange. They um, took a little slice out of the side of the beet and a little wedge, and you can do this out of beets and then tasted them. So you can actually taste the beets. And so out of that, then they selected down further. I don't remember how many uh, they ended up with, but it was very few compared to what they had in the field. And then they um, pack that, those in damp sawdust. There's a number of techniques you can read about to do this, or you can plant them right back in the ground if you're going to mulch adequately, or say you live in Phoenix or a warmer area. And uh, let them come up next year. They'll get all the green leaves. And then um, after a month or so, they'll set up a seed stock and they'll produce their seeds. And they'll be, you'll be producing seeds from those beads that you've selected for whatever shape and size and flavor that you want. Carrots are a little different in that you don't take a slice out of the side, but you can actually just lop it off. Just leave about three inches of it if you really want a good start for the carrot for the next year. And so um, people that store them in sawdust actually lop off the tops too because they don't have room. So about an inch above the greens, you can lop those off. You can cut and leave about three inches of the root on, put them in sawdust, take them back out, plant them, and use them the next year. And that way you can really taste for flavor on the biennials. And so again, this is a theme that you'll get into with seed saving. What looked like a problem and what looked like difficulty ends up being something that really helps you to actually select and get down the road and get something better for yourself. All right, so I'm going to uh, take questions and if you want to take a little break before we get into talking a little bit more in depth, I'm gonna double click on selection and breeding here a little bit and then finish with epigenetics. So any questions, you can put them in the chat or you can uh, unmute yourself and ask them, but I'll be sitting here. Yeah, I don't see any questions in the chat, but um, okay. feel free to just unmute and ask away. And again, you, you're welcome to ask specific questions that only will make sense for you you know and there's no you know it doesn't matter how simplistic or you know, there's no embarrassing questions you know but what as i said last week the most important information for your garden will come from questions that you ask about your garden and there's no generalized knowledge for that because you're different than every other garden there is so so i may May I just ask then, I'm just trying to sort of get clarification like on the carrots then, if you're, because they're biennial, you're saving them to grow seeds for the next year. And so you're pulling them out of the ground to kind of select for, you know, whatever qualities, best qualities you're wanting, and then taking a slice off the bottom of that perhaps to taste it as well. Is that, and then if you find the one you want, you then plant it back in the ground. Yes. Um, and then cut off the, how much of the top do you cut off to? Well, you know, if you're just going to plant it right back in the ground, what I do is I, you know, I leave six inches or so of the top on it. Okay. I've seen, you know, a professional carrot breeders cut it way down. They say to leave at least an inch of it. And the cool thing about this is that um, if you've got, you know, a pretty intensive garden where you're growing things, it's the end of the year, you pull everything up. That's great. You got to get the bed ready for another crop. You can then the carrots that you taste and eat and that you trim, you can plant them over by the fence. You can plant them over in a different bed to grow seed. And so here's the cool thing about carrots. When you do that, you want to space them at about two to three feet spacing. You know, carrots normally are like four inches. Space them out two or three feet because those flowers get that big. It's amazing what happens. And guess what they are? Dacus carata has another name. It's Queen Anne's place. It's a flower. You would have to pay for it to go down to the florist 
who pro- which probably has it. They use them for weddings. They use them for all sorts of things. They're beautiful white flowers. And so, um, you know, throw in a few extra and have cut flowers for the summer as well as growing seed for your carrots. And again, off of one plant, you should do more than one. I can't remember what the, the minimum. I always try to do six or eight plants. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, you'll get enough carrot seeds for all of Prescott forever. <laughs> off of one of your own backyard crop. And that's why you need the seed library because you're going to feel guilty. You're going to have a bag of carrot seeds this big. And so like, what do I do? I can't keep them here. And they're starting to die because I, I thought I'd do something with them and it's been a year or two, you know, clean them up a little and take them down and give them to Sarah, you know, and let all of Prescott have free carrot seed. I mean, that's, this is the system that we're part of. Does that help? Okay. Yeah. No, that, thank you so much. Yeah, that actually helps me because I do crop rotation. So if I know I can plant them in their next bed, yeah. um, that actually works out really well as, as, as well, so. In that, in that little basic seed saving book, it has all the biennials and it gives us spacing and it talks about those kinds of numbers that you'll need. Okay, yeah, thank, I mean, sometimes I just accidentally leave them in the garden anyways, and so I let them flower and it, there you go. the pollinators yeah. like it the next year, but um, yeah, all right, that's thanks. I, that's what our friend Greg Peterson, he's famous seed saver in Phoenix, and, that, and it's because he's negligent. <laughs> he's actually didn't, he was too lazy to go out and dig them all up, you know, and they just flower and he gets all these seeds, so yeah. Love you, Greg. <laughs> All right, well, let me get started again um, uh, because this might help and maybe we'll get some more questions as we start rolling. And, and if you've got a burning desire, interrupt me. You know, you don't have to wait till the end to do this. So, so um, that picture is Carrot Valley. That's what it's known in Afghanistan. This is the valley in Carrot. Why do they call it that? That is where carrots came from. Okay, this is the first known place where carrots were cultivated. And so uh, we've got all sorts of archeological, uh, and um, historical data to, to, uh, to support that. And so, as I said before, on the left is Dacus carata or Queen Anne's lace. And this is actually not just a flower that's grown for florists, it's a noxious weed in some states. It's illegal to grow it in your yard because those egg produces so many seeds and it gets out of control in some areas and hurts agriculture. And so, um, and there is no difference on a species level between the picture on the left and the picture on the right. And the only real difference is, is uh, hundreds of years of somebody saving seeds from one of a plant in their yard that tasted a little bit better, that wasn't as bitter, that wasn't black. Originally, Dacus carata was just saved for medicine. It's got all sorts of bitter alkaloids in it that are really good medicine. And it evolved into this sugar uh, you know, rush Thing in our modern society. And it, that all that breeding was done, 99.99% of that breeding was done before 1900, before we had modern breeding techniques and genetics. And we didn't have a map of its changes. So if you go back to the, before the early 900s, it was being grown in this valley in Afghanistan, but it was only purple and yellow colors. Those are the first colors to come out of those dark roots. And then you can see the colors start to go, you know, evolve. It's not till the 1500s that anybody anywhere talks about orange carrots. And that was largely, we think, a project of the Franciscan monks during the Middle Ages who had bad eyesight and were trying to copy down all those books, right? And somehow they were drawn to orange, carotene, that was good for their eyes. That's one of the theories anyway. And so, you know, this is how it works. People, people, they start saving their a different culture has a different color they like or they further or whatever. And that's really, you know, gives you a picture of selection itself as a simple, just save seeds from what you want and how our modern food crops evolved. So one of my other favorite ones is lettuce. So um, that, uh, that's just the weed, lactucus. Um, uh, vulgaris, we call it now, um, growing in the alley. I took that picture in an alley in Phoenix, I think. And it's bitter 
and it's hardly to taste. I mean, if you go on an herb walk, the herbalist will say, oh yeah, it's edible. It's lettuce and it is lettuce. It's exactly the same plant as the, as the romaine on the right, exactly the same plant, except for selections. Um, and when it's really young and in the shade, maybe you'll get a leaf or two that's not too bitter. And so who did all that work, all that selection work? Well, there's a picture of a Romaine on a tomb that um, 1000 BC in Egypt. It was the Egyptians that did most of this work way back. Lettuce is a gift from way, way back. Um, and, um, and it's a gift. And it just irks me to open Johnny's Selected Seed Catalog these days and see certified organic lettuce seed and see 67% of the varieties in there have utility patents on them now, which means it's illegal to save the seeds for the first time. This has just happened in the last few years. And so it's like 4,000 years of people working on lettuce to adapt it and to get it to romaine. And a few uh, German scientists changed genes just a little bit through traditional breeding techniques and now own it and say, no, nah, sorry, we own the whole thing. You cannot save your own seeds anymore. I mean, it's just this ludicrous thought that's going on. And one of the other most famous ones, Brassica oleracea. This is a wild mustard that grew in Northern Europe. And depending on where people took this, this uh, green, and it was really favored because it, it started to give people fresh vitamin C and some other vitamins early in the year. It was really cold hardy. So it would come up in Northern Europe. And depending on where you took it and what you saved the seeds for, look at what came out of it. And this probably only took a few hundred years as agriculture was so fractured as the communities were. In, in uh, especially in Germany. So kohlrabi and kale and broccoli, and, and they'll all cross. They're all exactly the same plant at the species level. I said that last week. Species means that everything in that species will cross with itself. And again, all that work was done before anybody knew anything about genetics. And then, uh, you know, here in the Southwest, chiltepines, you know, that's a chiltepine plant on the left that I took a picture of it that I took at Native Seed Search. Uh, that's the mother plant of all chilies. That's where all, this is capsicum annuum. On the right is capsicum annuum. There are other chilies in other species, but almost all the, of what we know as modern people chilies, the vast majority worldwide are capsicum annuum. And that sort of selection, again, Dr. Gary Nabin at the University of Arizona, you know, they, he speculates it took less than 200 years to tease out by saving what you wanted that was different than a chiltepine, um, to get all the shapes, sizes, and colors and get it taken all over. This is the Colombian diaspora. After Columbus came to the New World and they took peppers back and then they, some got taken to Thailand, some, you know, the Hungarian hot wax. We've got peppers all over the world that are favored. And all of those came out of those capsicumaniums probably in Northern Mexico, Southern Arizona. Wild tepary beans, if anybody's had tepary beans, you know, these are what wild tepary beans. I saw a picture, a good friend of mine uh, that used to work at Native Seed Search was out gathering them. Still grow, you can still gather them. And some, somehow, we don't know how far back, the Hohokum, the Sanawa, who knows who it was, started saving the seeds and, and saving them from ones that are a little bit bigger and the gift that they literally handed handfuls of to Father Kino, the first missionary that came to Arizona, were these, tepary beans. There, he goes, my God, these are beans. Where did you get these? You know, beans come from the old world. They go, no, these are our beans. These are fesolas. These are, these are our beans. And they're drought tolerant. They're disease resistant. They're adapted to the Southwest, right? What a gift to have. And so if you haven't grown teparies, I really uh, advise you to do it and keep saving, keep selecting, keep this process going. And then because I'm so into grains these days, you know, and I explained that last week that 60% of the food we eat is uh, come from grains. Um, you know, you just can't ignore that. And they're so much fun. And they're so beautiful in your backyard home garden. And so here's a picture of wild einkorn, the first wheat. This is um, in Eastern Turkey. You can still go there. You can still gather it. In fact, we had Ellie Ragosa on our, in our seed school last week. And she was pointing out that a family there 
um, uh, Kagoa, they were talking about these wild einkorn fields. A family of four could gather wild einkorn seeds for a couple of weeks every year when it was ripe and get enough food for the year for their family. Think about what a productive, you don't have to grow anything. You don't have to take care of a garden. You don't have to harvest. You just go out once a year for two weeks and you get enough grain for your family for the year. Wow, think about that. So this is the little chart we show in uh, grain school about the evolution of wheat that wild einkorn crossed with a wild goat grass and that became the wild and cultivated emmers. One of those we still eat a lot of today, semolina, pasta wheat, it's grown all over the world. Somehow that crossed with uh, another wild grass and that became modern wheat, cultivated modern wheats. And those have been around for 8,000 years or so. This happened a long time ago. And so, you know, and somewhere along the line, somebody found one after that cross and they and liked the characteristics. They were larger, they were more adaptable, who knows what it was. And that went boom into the hundreds of thousands of varieties of wheats that we have worldwide. Kind of shows you some of the complexity in it, you know, things like the great land races like Turkey Red and some of these other grains that we're starting to find in our grain trials program and bring back you know, things like white Sonora that are adapted to our areas and it's really been fun. And then probably the, our mother plant is corn. There's Teosinte, it's a wild grass basically, um, gets about two feet tall, has these little hard kernels that grow on the top of it. And from that and these hard kernels, again, th there are stories that with baskets, you could go out when it was ripe and collect a huge amount of seed in a year. And that, you know, gave the idea that let's cultivate it. Let's start saving these seeds. Let's only plant back the ones that we like. And that gave rise to corn over the last 8,700 years. And again, all this happened without anybody really knowing what they were doing. No more than you know in your own backyard right now. And we know that Teosinte is the, the uh, mother of all corn because there's a cross. They cross. They're the same plant. That thing in the middle is a uh, what is Joseph Lofthouse called those? Um, he's got a really great name and you can get, you can buy these crosses now and play with them if you want to, it's really fun. We've got archeological records all the way through. There's uh, been articles circulating in the New York Times and the Washington Post just in the last few days, there's a new breakthrough in um, 9,000 year old ears of corn that are being found in Honduras and, and their DNA sequences and pointing out that they actually came out of South America that after corn was probably first developed around Oaxaca was taken into South America where it was developed and then brought back to Central America as part of the corn story before it came north. And so when it did come north, it took about 4,000 years of saving this tropical grass that doesn't like to change the day length, doesn't like shorter seasons, which happens every time you go north, right? So it took a long time of somebody trying it and then saving seeds and trying it and saving seeds. Oh, that one worked. Let's move. Now we can plant it here. Did that for 4,000 years before it got to the U.S. border, roughly. And the oldest evidence of agriculture in the United States of America, cultivated agriculture, is in an archaeological dig just north of Tucson in Marana, Arizona. And when they dug it up and they did DNA tests and they tried to figure out what they were eating, especially around their kitchens, that's what it was, chapalote. So that was 4,000 years ago. That's how good corn looked. And we still have it. It's still around. It's, you can buy it. It's just one of the most delicious and incredible things I've ever had. So if you want to like bring this old story into your garden, I really, I highly um, suggest doing it at least at one, one point in your life. And so, you know, then um, once it got to the U.S. border, it really didn't do much for um, a long time. And it was only about a thousand years ago that we start to see evidence of corn all over the United States. And at first there were the flint corns that went way north, the dense and the flower corns came into the south. We kind of have a picture of what that looks like. But um, um, once somebody figured out varieties that would work in our colder northern climates again, um, it was everywhere because it's just so abundant. If you think about it, corn was the basis of the Inca, the Maya, and the Aztec civilizations, this wild plant, 
right, that they were saving seeds from. It's the basis of all those civilizations. And then Michael Pollan today calls it, uh, calls us the United States of corn. It's in 80% of all of our processed foods. So if you, if you don't think this is significant, you know, you've sort of missed the picture. And so one of the stories that I uh, learned uh, from John Navazio and uh, in our seed school is that, I, and I'm just going to go through this uh, for a couple of minutes to empower you because people go, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to get a few seeds, Bill, and I'm going to play around in my backyard. And I'm not even that good of a gardener. And, and, but, but you got me excited. It's okay. You know, I'll, I'll see what I can find. And so um, James L. Reed was doing that with corn and he lived in Missouri and he was one of the families that moved North. There was a land rush of sorts in the, uh, uh, sort of the just before the middle 1800s and he moved north to Illinois and he brought his corn with him by then he had this yellow dent corn he loved it it was good for flour they would make polenta you know their version of hominy or whatever grits um, and so they brought their corn with him and he planted it in northern Illinois and as I've been saying corn does not like to go north right varieties of corn do not like to go north so he planted it and it was a total failure as far as yield he got a few plants to work, but most of it just didn't work. He didn't have a long enough season. It was too cold for it, whatever. And his neighbors came over and they go, oh, James, you're new. We all did this when we first got here too. And, and trust us, it doesn't work. The only corns that work up here are flint corns. They're the shiny ones. They look more like chapalote. And, and, and he goes, well, you know, I don't like those. It gets in my teeth. I, it just doesn't make as good a flower. He goes, I like my corn. And he said, well, you're going to have a hard time then. So he did have a hard time. But what he did was is cross in some of the flints that worked with his dance. And he got more and more to work. And after he got this ball rolling, he had three sons. And he said, boys, this is our corn. James L. Reed's yellow dent corn. He goes, this is what it looks like. So every year we grow this, I want you to go through and find a thousand years of the best in, of these ears, just like this. And those will be the ones we plant for next year. And that's just what we'll do. And they did that for 40 years, this family did. And in 1890 or something, it wins the Illinois Fair for best, um, best corn in Illinois. And the next year in the Chicago um, World's Fair happened in Illinois. And so somebody said, well, you ought to take your corn up to the World's Fair, won the World's Fair, best corn in the World's Fair. And James L. Reed's yellow dent corn went on to be the largest selling corn, open pollinated corn in the world in the 20th century. Think about that. One family in their own backyard, just trying to find out what they wanted. And agriculture has more than one story like this. These stories have been taken away from us. We think it has to be done in laboratories. We think you need universities. We think we need all these other, that's all done by other people that understand genetics. Nope. This was mostly done before Mendel was even rediscovered in the early 1900s, right? We knew enough about what was going on. And I've oversimplified the story, I know, but the basis of what I'm talking about is in there. So I just want you to remember that, that you can change the world. And I've got all sorts, if you don't believe me, I've got other stories of people that have done it in my lifetime. Dave Christensen with Painted Mountain Corn has done the same thing. His corn's on all seven continents. Earliest, fastest maturing, um, most nutritious corn on seven continents right now. And that was all done by one guy in Montana in his backyard, if you're familiar with painted mountain corn. And I'll just throw in this little slide because it really, I think, focuses on what's going on is um, uh, Haas, Mr. Haas here, Rudolph, um, had a weird um, avocado tree come up in his backyard in San Diego. And um, the avocados were different than anything he'd ever seen before. It had been a cross and it was just one, uh, an avocado had fallen on the ground and grew up into a tree. And his wife, you know, it was a pretty, it was kind of a mid-sized or small tree. It was still young. And his wife goes, you know, I just don't like them. Let's just dig this up and go on. And he goes, no, no, honey, I love these avocados. I think these are better. And so she let him keep it. And uh, today, 80% of all the avocados grown that we eat in the United States are descendants of that single tree. And this points out the importance of selection. 
of, of, of uh, trusting that anomalies can happen. They're going to happen. Weird crosses are going to happen. Who knows what happens? But don't underestimate your own power to find something that's really, really um, delicious and beautiful that could change the world, like Haas's avocados, all right? One of the other things we talked about, and this is advanced, more advanced, is dehybridizing. We talked about that you can dehybridize. It's a bit of an adventure. But sometimes when you do that, like gypsy F1 peppers that I grew, you save the seeds from the hybrid and you plant them out and everything looks just like gypsies. And you go, what's going on here? So I saved the seeds again, planted them out. They look like F1 gypsies. And I was scratching my head going, this is not acting like a hybrid. Well, it's not. What has happened is that the company that sells this hybrid went ahead and did the work that we talked about last week and stabilized their lines, all right? So they don't have to pay people to hand pollinate anymore, which is hugely expensive. And they have made an open pollinated variety out of their hybrid. But they leave the F1 or hybrid name on it, on the packet, so that you think you need to buy it every year, right? That's most American gardeners don't want to go through the hassle. They want the uniformity and the predictability. And I, I'm not, we should want that if that's what you want. You know, you can have that, you can just buy it. But it's not fair. <laughs> so what's happening is there are a number of tomatoes that are this way too. And there's sort of this underground of people that are saving seeds from hybrid tomatoes and peppers and finding out that they're not hybrid. So I invite you to do that. And I invite you to ignore the hybrid um, moniker on a packet from now on as far as your seed saving and just start saving seeds and see where it takes you. And as I said last uh, week, you know, by the third generation, you start should start to have a working population of whatever you're working with. And one of the other most important things that you could should think about when, uh, when you're learning this stuff is, again, I just want to emphasize how important selection is. Selection is the thing that will help us get by, that, that we as home gardeners can use, is save the seeds from those things that work. It's pretty simple, or that you like, that tastes better. So here's a picture at UC Davis um, of peppers. This was a huge, big trial, say we're doing a peppers, and oh, oh no, Phythoptera. It's a rust, got into the peppers, and look what it does, boom. It's just like wiping out you know, most of the crops. So by most you know, uh, estimates, this is a disaster. To John Navazio, and, you know, one of the breeders at Johnny Selected Seeds and a friend of ours and one of our former seed school teachers says, oh boy, this is what we were looking for. Because if you look, there are peppers that make it. They are naturally resistant. This is called horizontal resistance. So you save the seeds from those and bring them out the next year in a field that's infected and plant them again until you find varieties that are wholly resistant to whatever disease or pressure that you're under, whether it's frost, whether it's 130 degrees with your tomatoes in, in uh, Phoenix in the summers, whether it's a disease like this, whatever it is, if you have a disaster, that's the best thing that happens to you because if something makes it, it makes it. And that's what you're looking for as a seed saver genetically. So just don't forget that. And so what I'm gonna do now is do a little bit of a double um, click on why that works and what's going on with it, all right? That's beyond genetics, all right? Because genetics would teach us, Mendelian genetics especially, is that um, in order to get that trait or traits into peppers that were resistant, resistant to Phythoptera, you would have to breed a new line of peppers. You would have to bring that resistance into your line. And that works that way and you can do that. And that's what modern breeding does. And that's why it's come up with all these shortcuts to be able to do that, even genetic engineering, which they say they can do now with precision, which um, there are still a lot of questions and is a field that's beyond today's course. However, what we do know is that as home gardeners, we can start to see changes even in one year, even when things don't cross. And so how do we explain that? 
Well, epigenetics helps explain it. And I'm not going to do the whole thing, but I'm going to show you just a few slides that I got from Dr. Bradley Tunnison, who I saw uh, uh, give a, a presentation at the New Mexico Organic Com uh, Farmers Conference a few years ago. And I asked Bradley if I could do this. And he's such a great guy in uh, sharing his work. So thank you, Dr. Tonneson, or Brad, as we call him. And so um, basically, you know, he did his work. He just got his PhD in plant genetics and breeding. All right. So he's been in that world. And as I said, almost all the work being done in that world is sequencing DNA and then using that to genetically engineer. So he was on that track to do that and understands it. And he did his work in rice. I think he sequenced like, I don't know, 7,000 varieties of rice was part of his work as a graduate student. And what you learn is that um, different um, uh, families of characteristics for different kinds of rice uh, come from different regions. You know, and that makes sense, right? You, the people in India, when they say rice, it worked in India and, and a different set of characteristics over thousands of years emerged in that rice that is different from say uh, Japan or uh, tropical rices or whatever. And so you can start to draw circles. You can start to see similarities in what's going on. And we know that this is sort of the basis of our understanding of modern genetics. But there's something going on beyond that. And epigenetics, epi means beyond, beyond genetics. And this has been um, studied and documented. This isn't new foo-foo stuff. This is, in fact, a woman, I'm trying to think of her name, won the Nobel Prize about 25 years ago for her study in epigenetics. So this has been well documented and understood in science. It just hasn't been brought to home gardeners yet is a way of explaining what's going on in the world. And I think that's a crime actually, because what it does is empower us to understand the changes that are happening in our own gardens without needing genetic engineering, without needing a laboratory to sequence DNA. And so in a sense, we're pulling the curtain back, you know, on the wizard. And we're saying, well, the great and powerful plant breeders and you need genetics and all this modern stuff to do it. And we're going, oh, no, you don't. <laughs> we're already there. We've got our glass slippers, right? They were in the garden all along, sorry. And in a sense, that's how I see this. And so, and Bradley saw this actually too, and then took a detour out of the university. He's not teaching in one of the um, universities where, where he could have gotten a job teaching you know, genetics and um, genetic engineering. He's now a county extension agent and in charge of research out in New Mexico and calls himself a spiritual gardener. And um, because it's kind of from some of what he learned here. So I'll let, that's a long way of explaining what's going on here. But basically um, what epigenetics has taught us is that um, uh, there can be a change in genetic activity. And because of change in genetic activity, that's the secretion and the uh, production of certain proteins in a plant. So you can completely change the plant. You can make it bigger or smaller. You can close it down so it can go through heat better. You can um, uh, close stoma so that it doesn't transpire as much so it can go through droughts. All those things can happen to a plant during the year. And we know that, all right? It's called defensive prime priming and plants go through that. And this makes sense to us. We see these sort of, we see even physically see plants change. All right. So how do they, how do they actually happen? Well, what we know now because of epigenetics is that genes are turned off or on by rolling them up, by tight coiling of them or unrolling them. And plants can do this in real time. And the real breakthrough in the understanding of epigenetics is then in learning that if a plant goes through this defensive stress in a year and say it rolls up its DNA real tight, it passes on rolled up DNA as well as its genetics to its offspring. So in one year, you can get offspring that actually have built-in defensive priming to what happened in your garden in that year. And so is this complicated? It's unbelievably complicated. We don't know all the things and all the traits and all the plants that are reacting all day, every day. Was it starlight? Was it radiation? What, what? We have no idea what's going on. And guess what? We don't have to. 
The plant's taking care of all of that for us. It's just passing it on to its offspring. And that is why seed saving is so important. It's the most important thing we can do to learn, relearn, to adapt plants to where we are. We use its intelligence to do it. And so, and this happens in all sorts of ways, as you know, this little drawing of Bradley's was meant to, to show is that whether it's stress from the sun, UV, bacterial infections. And so he's done some work. And, and, and if you want more on this, you know, we have a seed school online um, through Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance that you can um, look at. It's one of those online courses that's done like a university. Thank you, Renee has worked on this. We use Learn Dash, this learning program. And I think it's a $40 thing, but um, we have all of Bradley's lecture as part of that series. It's one of the bonus lectures. And so if you really want to get into this and double click on it, I invite you to do that. And one of the other lectures we've had we were lucky enough to get Dr. Margot Bradley, who teaches uh, full-time patent law at, I'll think of the name of her university here in a second. It's, it's losing me here late in the day. Um, um, she um, started, um, she gave us a full, a full rundown on the legalities of what's going on with plant patenting right now. And that's, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that in our last, section as we start talking about stewarding. So I'm going to give us a little bit of a break again now, and it's um, and I can answer questions, and I can remember things like Emory University <laughs> is where she teaches. So if you've got a question, come on and ask it or write it in the chat. So Wasn't Dr. Bagley uh, a guest on our seed social? You know, I can't remember. I went back in and looked at Seed School Online Learn Dash, and we have her as one of the lecturers. Okay. I'm wondering when we did that. Yeah, she was really, really interesting. And wow, she, she told us a lot. I was introduced to her in Rome. She's oh. a... She's a consultant on an international level for people that are fighting plant patenting worldwide and is renowned as an expert. She just sits down and clarifies things because there's a lot of misinformation about it. It's really an interesting thing to get into. And it's something that I'm going to talk about as once we get back on a little bit, I'm trying to demystify it a little bit and especially um, key up um, seed librarians as to what they, uh, they should watch out for, so. Yeah, I was just curious, Bill, you said that Johnny's seeds had patent rights to, to just home gardening, little seed packets, like yeah. our little, really? Yeah, well, see, I'll show you the next slide um, while I'm here. Um, yeah, um, this is something that's been happening, you know, um, <clears throat> certified organic seed is pretty rare still. It's a very small part of the whole seed world. And it's been something that organic uh, farming associations and, and marketing associations have been trying to do because it's another market. Uh, it doesn't make sense to have organic agriculture if the seeds are grown with chemicals. Mm -hmm. And I get that and it makes sense. But what has happened is that the three companies across the top of that slide have taken advantage of this and built multi-million dollar businesses around it. And as they've created new varieties, certified organic varieties, especially, they patented them. They're using plant patenting for the, so for the first time. And then they sell to high mowing and Johnny's and Territorial and other catalogs. And they don't talk about it. Nobody's talking about it. It's okay. hard to find them. And I'm, I'm going to go into a little bit of that and what you need to look for. And okay. it's, it seems like what they're doing over the last three years, it's gone from 28% of the lettuces in Johnny's catalog up to 46%. And their goal, frankly, somebody in Rome told me, their goal is all of them. They want to own it all. And Vitalis is owned by Enzazaden, which is a German chemical company. And, and it's really an interesting, interesting thing. There, you know, I'm, I'm, in the end, I don't want to tell people 
where to buy their seats or what they should buy or what they want. If you want to buy patented seats, you can. What I want is openness, honesty, and transparency in it. And that's not there. I found several varieties in the Johnny's catalog that weren't even listed as utility patented that are, that were mistakes. When I asked them what they were going to do, they said, well, maybe next fall when we do a new catalog, we'll change it. You know, they just, they did, didn't make any um, difference or sense to them. So. So I have like, you know, the botanical interest, USDA organic. Are you sort of saying like they might grow this plant organic, but the seed is I don't understand how a seed could not be organic if it was grown organic with um, organic methods. You know what I mean? Right. So if it does, if you see a seed packet with the the USDA organic, yeah, um, symbol on it, then it's been grown organically. Okay. okay. And uh, but what I'm saying is that uh, the vast majority, especially the garden seed in America that's that's sold and used, is has not been grown organically there are a few it, companies that have gotten into it and botanical interest is one of them but and they're not patented right than others so what's that right, but botanical is not patented no well we don't These know things reseed in my yard which i love i just right. any kind of over cover crop I, i'm like please just keep reseeding right. so i don't have to keep planting you what i'm saying is you don't know for sure no. oh i see there are several um, varieties of basil that have been patented what? There's this field day of, of patenting going on right now, okay. you know, with hundreds of thousands of patents being um, filed every year for things like um, one of the patents I saw was heat tolerance in brassicas is now patented. Um, Frank Morton talks about purple in lettuce has been patented. Well, what purple? You know, and they tried, they've got a scientific explanation. So does that mean when my purple lettuce goes to seed in my garden, nobody will answer the questions even. It's really kind of a murky. And I think that murkiness helps them just roll it all out till it's too late, right? Wow. Oh, well, everything's patented. Why worry about it? Mm. So that's my fear. So yeah, let me just uh, head into this a little bit. So I, I talked about the three companies there. And so all I want you to do is start looking in your catalogs more, more uh, carefully. This is in the Johnny's catalog and they explain utility patents. Seeds can only be used for crop production, period. They cannot be used for seed saving, replanting, resale, giving away or use in any breeding program. That's the most restrictive, um, uh, right, ever granted anybody on any level on the history of the world. And we have that being allowed in this country with utility patents now. All right. In a sense, you're renting your seeds to grow one crop and that's it. And you're not even supposed to allow it to go to seed. You know, if you just read the fine print. And so the U.S. has had another way of restricting um, the sale of seeds called the Plant Variety Protection Act. And that was passed in the 70s. And that's done in the USDA. This isn't patenting, but this was to give breeders a 20 year head start if they bred something new. But what was really important about the PVPA Act, as they call it, the Plant Variety Protection Act, was that it, may, it left open a breeder's exemption and a farmer's exemption. So what does that mean? Well, in night, even in 1970s, um, US um, Nixon was the president at the time. Uh, when this was passed, um, nobody, nobody would allow the kind of protection would, that would keep farmers from saving their own seeds. Just wasn't going to happen. 10,000 years. That's how we've always done it. All farmers could, should be able to save their own seeds. And so that was an exemption in this PVP Act, right? And a breeder's exemption. So if another breeder wanted to take your material and start breeding something new, they could do that too. Now, you couldn't a farmer couldn't save his own seeds and then try to sell those seeds, but he could save his own seeds year after year and adapt it to his own farm. That was always allowed. Well, with utility patenting psh, gone for the first time, there is no exemption. And that's what makes it so dangerous. And so if I wrote to Johnny's, I do this every year. Uh, can you give me a list of all the plants that you sell that have utility patents? No master list that contains all patented or protected varieties exists. That's I get some form of this letter back every year. 
you know, they say, oh, go look yourself. Go to the plant, the patent and trade office. You can search for them. So I did. I tried to find all the varieties. Here's one that came up. Um, New ham lettuce. That's a Johnny's lettuce that's in their catalog. Here it is. It's patented. It just says Enza Zaden owns it. That's the Ger German chemical company. Okay, I get that. But the problem was when I looked and I started back crossing and from what I know about the just the lettuces in the Johnny's catalog, 78 out of the 99 varieties of lettuce listed in their catalog are not traceable in the databases. It's because traits were patented and not the variety names. The variety names never come up. So there's really no way to find out. Johnny's won't tell me. And sometimes they make mistakes in their catalog. Sometimes they say them, some catalogs don't say it. So that's kind of where we are right now with this stuff. So, you know, I found that 56 out of 99 lettuces were protected. 46 out of the 99 were utility patented. 36 out of the 99 were PVP. And only 21 out of the 99 lettuces in the Johnny's catalog were searchable in either PVP or, or trade and patent office databases. Just no way to tell. The whole thing's just being hidden. So, you know, if you look carefully, so Salmonova doesn't come up in the database. And why? Well, if you look carefully, and they've taken this out of the Johnny's catalog this year, you don't even have this in it, but it showed the utility patent numbers. Well, those patents are all for traits. Salvanova was never patented, but it is patented because it's got these three traits that are patented. That's how, how uh, um, complicated it gets. And then here, um, here's where they actually say this variety, they say is utility patent granted. They don't do it in a systematic way, they kind of hide it in the copy. You really have to dig to find out what's patented or not. It's like they don't want you to know. That was my feeling. And then territorial, here's a better head lettuce um, that is patented, utility patented, no mention, no mention at all. You just buy it and you have it. And the, what's wrong with that is that, um, well, I'll go into what's wrong with it. You know, I was in one of the catalogs looking um, um, uh, for patented varieties. And I saw this little um, C-A-I-B. And I go, what's A-I-B? So I um, Google searched it and it came up. It's the Anti Infringement Bureau for Intellectual Property Rights on Plant Material. What's that? It's a worldwide agency that's been funded by uh, these chemical companies largely. And you see Bejo and Anzazadin up there at the top. They're the ones that are doing the certified organic seed that's being sold in our catalogs, right? Uh, as well as other big companies, Bayer, you know, the biggest companies. And they've pooled their money to find a way to um, collectively enforce utility patent rules. Okay. And so if you dig a little deeper into their website, and I'm not going to go into the whole thing, but you get language like this. The production, use, and trading of illegal products is an important source for the financing of organized crime. So does that mean if I buy my seeds out of the, the territorial um, catalog and I'm saving my own seeds and they're utility patented that I'm organized crime? I mean, that's kind of, and you go, well, they're so far away, they're not going to care or whatever. But now we have the Seed Innovation and Protection Alliance, which is in the U.S. With, look in the upper right. They've got a hotline tip number. If somebody sees you growing something that they think is utility patented, they can actually get a reward for turning you in. So this is where this uh, we we've seen. You know, you don't hear. We you, we know Percy Smizer. You know, went through all of his stuff. And we know that everybody that Monsanto sued lost their lost their lawsuits to Monsanto. But this is kind of bringing in a new level. And I, this is just what I'm reading and whatever. And this disturbs me. And so the real reason this disturbs me is that um, you know a few years ago they shut down the seed library in Pennsylvania. One of the seed control official for, for Pennsylvania um, saw on the evening news one night they were opening up a seed library in his town. And he's going, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm the seed control official for the state. You need a license to give out seeds. You can't do that. So he went down and shut them down the next day. And um, it made international news. Seed library crushed by you know local seed. They wanted them to have seed dealers licenses and do germination tests and all the other things you have to do for big seed companies. 
So what do we do? So I was part of a group of people, you know, Rebecca Newburn, who helped start the first seed library and others. And we got together and we got together with the library. And then we found out that the best way to proceed was um, with the uh, it's an American Association of Seed Control Officials. Turns out like this guy's part of a national group of people that that talk about this kind of stuff. So we met with them for a year, a committee did. My wife, um, Belle um, Starr, uh, was actually on that committee. And what we tried to do is convince them over a year, it took a year to convince them that seed libraries weren't seed businesses, that we weren't a threat, and that they had fears about what was going on, but we could address those fears. And so we finally got them to accept, and it's in, written in the, what they call the Russell, their recommendation to all the states now, the recommended uniform state seed laws, is that seed libraries don't need fees. They don't need germination tests. They don't need expiration dates. That they can freely give out and share seeds. And it's not a threat to seed control officials. That's where we got to, okay? But the agreement came with some quid pro quos. And one of them is that there must be a sign in your seed library that states that patented seed or varieties protected by the Plant Variety Protection Act will not be accepted or distributed in this seed library. That's one of the official things that came out of that. And so that's my fear is that we're buying patented seeds now we think we're doing the right things because they're certified organic. We're saving the seeds and we're taking them down to our local seed library. Uh-oh. And we just gave them the ability to shut us down again. And, and my own opinion, and it's just an opinion, is that that, boom. Those commies that are out there in the hinterland sharing seeds with this thing called gift economy, that are undermining our innovation and our patent laws as good Americans, they shouldn't be able to, shouldn't be able to do that. And so that's one of the reasons why I'm so. Uh, so who who is who is accepting these laws that they can patent our seeds like that? You know, it was never passed as a law. It was a Supreme Court decision, a five to four Supreme Court decision that allowed seeds to be patented for the first time, actually life forms. And the, it's ironic that the deciding vote was Clarence Thomas on the US Supreme Court. And he's a former attorney for Monsanto back in his early days. And we're left with this whole bag, this mess. And so I'm, I'm saying the negative side and it's more complicated. There's all sorts of stuff going on. I invite you, um, uh, Dr. Bagley. It's just a way of controlling, controlling. So that means then they, that they're really basically only going to be the ones to be able to produce right. and sell those seeds and controlling who gets to do that. Right, exactly. And that's been their goal all along. And Dr. Uh, Jack Kloppenberg at University of uh, Wisconsin-Madison has a really great book called First the seed. If you're if you're interested in sort of the political economy underlying this uh, evolution to where seeds got patented, he does a great job of telling that story. Because in agriculture, everything else is controlled, and farmers have to buy it every year. But if you sell them seeds, and they can just keep producing their seeds forever and don't need you anymore, oops, that's lost profit. So they're trying to find a way to do that, and they have. So now the Europeans have have done a lot of work on this. And so they've got to the point right now in Europe, and it's being challenged by Monsanto or, or you know, um, Bear, which owns Monsanto now. There's lawsuits being filed. But as we speak, as my understanding in Europe, you cannot patent a variety of anything if it's been created using natural um, uh, processes, regular plant breeding. OK, the only thing they allow to they allow plants to be patented, but the only ones they allow are genetically engineered varieties, which they say are new inventions. We'll give you that. We, we don't want the whole GMO world anyway. We're not going to use it. Nobody's going to. We don't care about it on small scale agriculture. We're done with that. So you can have that. That was their compromise. But you can't patent our stuff. And that's what almost everything in the Johnny's catalog, everything in there was not genetically engineered. Johnny's wouldn't have it if it was. 
These are natural processes of plants. And the ironic thing is, Enzozodon sells all those same seeds in Europe without the patents and then sells them in the US with them because we allow it. Because we don't know, we haven't raised a stink, basically, is what I would say. This is what we need to do. We need to call them out. And <clears throat> I've been rather, I've been called out on that. Oh, Bill, you're just trying to stir up trouble. You're just trying to embarrass people in the organic movement. Well, no, I think there's more, more to it to, than that. And that's why I'm teaching it. So I leave it up to you guys to try to understand. Oh, All right. Amazing. So we have a patent-free seed campaign. And we're updating the website soon. I'm going to put up all the known varieties that I know about. We're going to have a form. So if you find ones, you can put them on there. And as a community, we can start to build our own list. Because as I said before, nobody's coming to help us. That's what's obvious now. Nobody wants to help us. They like the way things are. And just remember what Joy Hout said, who was one of the former directors at Native Seed Search. When you buy seeds, when you get seeds, when somebody gives you seeds, it doesn't matter. But when you choose a cultivar to plant, you are choosing an entire agricultural system. So think about that. If you don't know where they came from and you don't know who grew them, you may be supporting a whole industrial system that you just don't understand that's actually hurting your interests. So it's up for us now to find out where to get our seeds. So why not CD Saturday? This was started more than 10 years in Canada. It's become a national institution. Almost every city and town in Canada has a CD Saturday at least once a year. Some have more than one. Some have CD Sundays now. And it's just a big um, uh, seed exchange. Everybody in town and in the region comes together in one big hall and uh, gets the seeds they need for the year and brings what they have to share. And everybody talks and they find out what's best and everybody shares it and goes home. Really simple, easy, elegant way. Um, I was introduced to this in Siberia when I was there in 1989. At the end of the year in this Dacha village, they had a big seed um, uh, exchange potluck. Uh, entrance fee was your own seeds that you had saved. Something, you had to have saved something and then a dish for the potluck. And so that's a picture of me in the green t-shirt there in 1989. I went on a seed collecting um, expedition there. We were the first Western group to be allowed behind the Iron Curtain out into Siberia. I went on the Trans-Siberian Railroad for 5,000 miles out looking for Siberian tomatoes. And anyway, this was the most elegant thing I'd ever seen. I had, you know, what happened, what, what, what I learned was that, you know, Dima, this uh, chemical engineer I met had watermelons in Siberia. We'd heard rumors, but this guy had watermelon. It took him 12 years of growing, trying to grow watermelons. He had people give him seeds from all over and they always failed. Except one year, he got a little golf ball with two seeds in it and he saved them and planted them the next year. And out of that, he got another melon that was a little bit bigger. And through 12 years of just growing and saving, he had watermelons. And so everybody wanted Dima's watermelons. Well, if you didn't have something to trade him that was really good, he didn't have enough seed for you. There were just so many people wanted them. So you went home going, I'm going to save something really special this year so I can move to the top of the food chain and get. And so it was this kind of a, a dynamic in this community that was driving it to an excellence, especially around tomatoes. I mean, I walked out of there with seeds to 60 tomato varieties and 25 of them are still available commercially in the Western world. They're superior in all sorts of ways, disease resistance and flavor and whatever. And it was because these people were all growing and saving their own seeds and competing against each other in these seed exchanges. Real elegant way. Now, the problem with this seed exchange is that if you move to town on the day after CD Saturday, you have to wait till next year to get your seeds, right? It's once a year thing. And so that's where seed libraries come in. They're like a permanent public repository so people can come in throughout the year. They can take their seeds in and get them back. And I just went to seedlibraries.net. There's a list of all the sister seed libraries around the world. There are over 500 that are actually open and operational now. And if you think about that in less than a 10 year period, that is a phenomenal grassroots um, social and cultural movement. You know, we think about the, uh, the uh, Students for a Democratic Society, I do in the late 60s when I was 
when I was coming through the Vietnam period and we had to make big social changes and we saw groups, you know, coming up all over the country. There's nothing like 500 of these organized, self-organized independency libraries around the world. I think this is the hope. This is what's going to change things. And so you can go there. If you do nothing else, go there and subscribe to the Cool Beans newsletter that Rebecca Newburn puts out because this is the heart and the pulse of what's going on with seed saving. And um, we have Justine uh, Hernandez. I just got an email from her yesterday, you know, who came in and wanted to start a seed library in the Flowing Wells branch of the Pima County library system. And so I, we helped her pitch this idea to the librarians, to the central board, and we were turned down, actually. Um, they said, no, you can't open one at uh, Flowing Wells. Justine, we're going to open up nine seed libraries in nine of our 21 branches, and we're going to make you the head of it. And not only that, we're going to do interlibrary loan. And we're going to go down to the basement and get all the card catalogs out that we just threw away. And we're going to use those for the seeds. And last year, was it last year? Year before, Justine told me 50,000 packets were, were, were checked out. And over half of those seeds for the first time were seeds that had been checked in to the library. So this is like a shining example of where we can go. This is one of the most elegant systems to get seeds. You walk in, you're way out in Ajo. Arizona in the library. You can go into the library there and get on the computer and order up all your seeds. The stories are in there or whatever, and they'll bring them out of one of the other branches out to Ajo for you to have your seeds. And then if and when you can, you return twice as much. That's the rule, right? That's been around. Vanda Nashiva says that idea has been around for a thousand years. And in that way, everybody gets gets their seats. I had somebody last night, Alan Booker, who's in our grade school class was on a thing we did on Thursday night. And he was saying, oh yeah, Bill, that's, that's called regenerative um, capitalism. That's a capitalism where everybody gets wealthier the more you share it. That's not like the scarcity capitalism where a few people get richer because they restrict things. This is the opposite of that. And your whole community can get richer. So, you know, one of the other examples of what's going on around, around the world, I just wanted to pick out as we go here. And we're, these are ideas for where maybe we should be going. Um, uh, we heard about Politi, which is this Arch Noah is, is a nonprofit. They're at 8,000 members, and they're actually now the largest seed bank in Greece. They hold more seeds than the Greek National Seed Bank. Well, where are they? Well, they don't have a seed bank. They just have a big party every year. It's a food and music festival with a seed exchange and databases. And they keep careful track of who's got each seed and where they are. And those people are all pledged to share. So what we realized, actually, um, a woman in Tucson um, uh, uh, got this idea into my head the first time I heard about it. She said, Bill, we don't need a seed bank, which is a target, which could fail which somebody could attack. And we've seen seed banks around the world attacked, even by the US government and blown up as a strategic target. You don't need seed banks if you know where all the seeds are and people can get to them. All you need is a database. So that's what they're doing. And it's really this elegant. And so we sent John Cashett from Rocky Mountain Seed Line over there. There's Pangiotti who's started this whole thing. And actually we've uh, developed this friendship. Pangiotti came to our seed summit and um, we're hoping to do a seed festival like theirs like a Politi America. And we're working on a location along the Rio Grande River over in New Mexico where we could have hot springs. There's also hotels there. If people don't want to camp out or whatever. And Pangiotti said, he's going to fly to New York. He's going to rent a bus and they're going to do seed saving workshops in a caravan all the way across the United States coming to the American Politi in a seed festival. And so that's kind of where I'm going. I'm, I'm done with conferences and hotels around seeds. I'm going to get back to the heart and soul and song and dance of seeds. And, and thank you, Pangiotti, for showing us. You know, one of the great things that's happened, and that's uh, Miguel Bayon at Tusuke Pueblo just built their own seed bank. And I think we should have regional seed banks all over. And theirs is really beautiful. It's underground. It was Earthship built. It doesn't need any um, uh, cooling. It's really a beautiful, and we actually, Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance, we have seeds backed up there. It allows everybody to do safety backup. Every region should have safety backup. 
And if you're really into um, sharing your seeds, and you know, I just heard about another uh, database, the seed database that's going to save the world. Bill, all we have to do is get this database so everybody can share their seeds with each other. And I've seen about three or four of those come through and it never works very well. And why? We just don't have enough seed savers yet. If you think about it, they're out there, but they don't know. And it's just nobody has a marketing budget to try to get, say, the community seed um, uh, system marketed to everybody. And so um, what I always point out to them is that we already have that eBay. If you look on there, there's 142,995 seeds available. If you just put seeds in, there are people all over the world. A good friend of mine in Albuquerque was buying Siberian peppers. He goes, Bill, you don't have to go over there anymore. You just order them on eBay. <laughs> Amazon's the same thing. What's this? Uh, 60,000 varieties. There's some really interesting things on here. Electronic databases aren't going to save us. What's going to save us is each individual growing and saving their own seeds and sharing them with the people where they work best, those right around you, right? In your own area. And that's why seed exchanges and libraries are so important. And then once you do that, the next level of sharing is regionally. And that's why we started the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance. It just makes sense. It's like, why put all the energy into all these abstracts? And what I, what I foresee happening is when each region of the country has its own vibrant you know, seed production. So all the seeds from the Rocky Mountains come from the Rocky Mountains, right? Then you could link them all within the international network. And then that would start to make sense. So, so one of our students um, uh, started his own online thing for commercial, small amounts of commercial non-GMO and, and organic seeds. So you can go to Seedwise. If you've got seeds you want to share, you're trying to find them. If you're a wild crafter, you're doing wild seeds. Um, the BLM funded $25 million project uh, years ago now, and it's really grown. And there's hundreds of people that are growing um, now growing and um, block crafting seeds from our um, public lands all over the United States and then making them available through this network. And this doesn't cost anything. It just puts you in touch with the people that have the seeds. And you can really, you know, use this to find people that know something about a plant that you want to learn about. If you find somebody on here who's selling it, chances are they know about it. And so I use this for medicinal herb information and other, and other things. I found experts all over. So it's great to have this uh, native seed network up and running. I'm just trying to show you where you might be able to go if, you, if you're if you into you know, other levels of sharing. This is another couple that came to, I think, seed school number two that we did about eight, nine years ago and go, oh, we're gonna start our own seed company. And they've gone on to really great things. They're in the Bay Area, the Living Seed Company, Matthew and Astrid. And so you can do that, you know, that you can, uh, all you really need are your seeds that you know about and you can, and a website now, and you can get up and running and doing it. Need some packaging. This is where almost everybody in the industry gets their packets, Cambridge Pacific, no mystery there. You can get them blank. Now they'll print them all for you the way the big companies do, but um, you can get them blank and print your own now on your own laser writer. And that's what Bella and I did for a project that we were working on. And these make great business cards. They're fundraisers for nonprofits. Um, another one of our seed students years ago in Los Angeles, Joanne, came up with another idea. She found a, a template online for an eight and a half by 11 sheet, regular sheet of paper that she could fold using origami kind of style into its own seed packet. And then she learned that she could put graphics on it. So she got her community. She's part of a, uh, a church that has a garden that feeds homeless people in uh, Santa Monica. And so he, she got their artwork to use on the packets. And so you can kind of see what she's doing. So Cityscape Seeds was born. And they use this as a fundraiser for their for their homeless shelter part of their church and uh and everybody in the community takes part in folding them and putting the seeds in and they're growing they're saving the seeds right there in their own garden or whatever and so you know the the um opportunities for us to take this whole seed thing back on every level are just incredible and the creativity there and so you know become a teacher if you can um, this is from the Occidental Arts and Ecology Center in California that wrote a curriculum 
for K through 12 for teaching seed saving in the schools. It got approved by the California Department of Education and you can use this curriculum now in the schools. You can get a copy of this from, for free from OAEC if, you're, if you wanna bring this into the schools. Um, if you just wanna do your own seed saving courses there locally or whatever, if you need our help. And as I said, occasionally we do um, seed school teacher trainings. We did one at a hot springs in Idaho and it was really popular because we do these 20 minute um, soak breaks where everybody go out and soak in the hot water again. And then we'd all run back in to the classroom. And so it doesn't have to be an onerous. And basically what seed school teacher training does is just give you, a, open up a space for you to practice. You can see all the creativity and how other people are doing it. And then we keep, you know, reinforcing the major principles that we've found to be that um, students over a long period of time have wanted when they come to a C course, you know, what do people ask for and what do they really want? And so uh, that brings us to the people of the pinch. And this was in the, in the document that I got from the library and I know why. And so let me give you a little bit of the back story of this. I was giving a talk in Idaho at that hot springs one time, maybe it was that same teacher training. Um, and I got, um, pulled into a radio interview during the class. So the whole class is out soaking in the hot springs and doing stuff. And I went inside to where it was more quiet. And they put me on a radio show out of a small town, Basalt, Colorado. And it was an interview sort of program. And I was explaining what we're doing and saving seats or whatever. And, um, and I explained something that I often do in, in, at the ends of my seat schools. And so I'll do it now. And so it's kind of a visual thing where I say, well, you know, it took 10,000 years for humanity from wild plants to create the diversity that we have in our food system. And that in two generations, we lose 90% of it. It's not really lost, but we're just not using it. And if we don't use it, it will be lost. Seeds die. They're living embryos, right? So we're waking up here in the early 21st century. And we're realizing this is going to be really important, especially with climate change and the political storms we're facing. Everybody's trying to shorten their supply lines. And we're going to need more local agriculture. And if we don't have the seeds or they're all owned by a German chemical company that's contract growing them in China, then where does that leave us? Right? So a few of us are looking beyond the big screen di distractions that we have now in every home. Right? And we're looking past the religious dogma that's getting worse and worse you know, as we're going on. And the, the political bullshit that's going on, that's getting so much attention, especially on social media. And so underneath all of that are some people that are waking up and they're going, you know, you think this thing through, civilization started and was possible because of seeds and we're losing all the seeds. And if we don't have them, we can't have our own agriculture. If we don't have our own agriculture, we're not gonna be self-reliant or sustainable as we go into the future. The only way to do that is to fit ourselves in to a new carbon footprint and design a whole new agriculture that's ours. And fortunately, seeds are magical enough to allow us to do that. We just have to do it, right? So we're waking up and we're gonna start saving seeds and we're gonna build back the diversity. And so at some point out here, in about a thousand years, there's going to be somebody sitting in one of those dacha gardens in Siberia, who's a historian, who's looking at the whole history of what humanity did, and he, he, they're going to stand up and propose a toast to those people in the early 20th, 21st century, that before anybody else woke up and saw what really needed working on and started to do it and saved us, the people of the pinch, right? This pinch in genetic diversity. So that's where that came from. So I've been saying the story at the ends of our seed schools. And a couple of years ago in Prescott, we were invited to an event that was a play production of a poem called People of the Pinch. And it was, the ideas of what we're all trying to do on a community level have been raised to art. 
and reinforced in a crowd of people that like I just can't even believe. And so you can find the words to the whole poem on our website. And I'll, I don't know, I'm going to see if I can get this to play. I, I put this on and I'm not, oh, no, I don't think it's going to work. And you can, um, oh, maybe it is. We are the people of the pinch. We cup our eager palms beneath a narrow funnel and catch a thin trickle of the future in our hands. History pours herself into a wide stretched mouth and surrounds the tongue with stories of our origins, remembering the taste of our past. From wild beginnings of grass and seed, we selected in succession, the tree of life spread her leggish limbs and gave birth to accidental form. Saving each success, we gathered baskets of grain and medicine, fruit and fuel. The edifice of civilization was constructed in muddy furrows by women kneeling down on calloused knees in fields they made fertile. Wow. Questions? <laughs> so that's just the first part of the poem and you can read the whole thing on our website. So that's kind of what's going on, folks. <laughs> We've got like 12 or 13 minutes. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you. This is what we can do together. We can we can rebuild the community. And uh, um, that was read by Bellstar, my wife. And the woman that starts in there is Sephra Alexander, who is one of our seed school students, who now works for the Global Crop Diversity Trust and is helping in projects all over the world. And so sky's the limit. You want to get involved in teaching. You understand the basics of what's in this course. Trust me, this is it. The basics, the foundation of what you need to be, to start a seed company, to be a seed teacher, to go on and uh, transform your community have been in this course. And so, and we're, you know, the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance is not, was not started to be another nonprofit that has to raise money to save itself. I'm done with that. I did. I had to try to make a $1.2 million budget every year at Native Seed Search. We're done with that. What we're doing is trying to get all the seeds from our region, from our region. And as soon as that happens, we're going to dissolve ourselves. So we're here to help you. And all of our information, everything we do, we give away so that we could help that happen faster. That's what we're dedicated to. So, so thank you for coming to class. Before you get to any more questions, I do want to note to the people who are here, this is recorded and it will be available on YouTube as well as the first workshop. I think everybody that was here did go to the first one, but if you need that, that will be available on YouTube at some point. Um, and the slides and everything will be made available to you as well. You did have a question. Someone asked, um, Michelle says, do we have a seed bank here in Prescott or Prescott Valley or somewhere near here? Congratulations for uh, being the person to step up and start one. <laughs> you got to be careful what questions you ask, right? I, you know, so seed bank um, takes on a lot of different meanings. So in a sense, um, the rest of the world doesn't use the word seed library. Seed library is a seed bank. It's a place where the community can save its seeds and then come and get them again. Seed exchanges are that in a way, especially if you have a database um, attached to it. Um, we use the term seed bank to denote something really special now, and that means safety backup. To take a small portion of all the seeds that are being passed around in the community and get them out of your community. If you guys get a wildfire that sweeps through Prescott, they're all gone. It doesn't matter who's done what work. And, and, and even if it's a hundred years, thousands, it's priceless. And so every community should think about some way to do safety backup. And that's why small regional safety backup um, seed vaults is probably a good idea on some level. And no, there's nothing like that in and around here. We know of two in New Mexico and we back up seeds there to both. And one is at Tesuque Pueblo with the Miguel Bayon. The other is with Florida Mayo, one of the 13 sacred grandmothers in Estancia, New Mexico. There's a seed bank there. And so we're using those two now to do that. So I'm sure there's a ton of things involved, but um, so 
you have to kind of keep planting out the seeds to keep them viable, don't you? So that then they're replaced in some ways and don't die. Correct. But okay. how long? You know, um, lots of stories of bean seeds lasting 600 years in clay pots in the Southwest. So it doesn't, at, the, at least in the beginning, and as I said last week, you know, we re routinely got 90% germination on tomatoes and peppers after 10 years. And so for a community to start to organize itself, you know, you get, a, you, there's a bit of time before you have to actually worry about that. And, and so, you know, this is what gets seed banks, right? We go, oh my God, we got to save all these seeds. And they bring them all in like Native Seed Search did, 2000 varieties. But then they don't have the money to grow them back all out again, you know? So it's way better to have a living system like a seed bank be your seed bank in a sense to have a seed exchange to have a seed library where there's lots of people growing it and then that adds in the advantage that they're being grown every year at least somewhere somebody in your your valley or your community is probably growing every variety every year and so they're being readapted to the new changes that climate's bringing and so it becomes this moving living system is it perfect no nature never is but that's way better than this sort of We've hit this wall, they call it the gene bank bubble, where we've got like 7,400,000 accessions in 1,400 seed banks around the world, and nobody has the money to grow out what's in their seed bank. And I'm, you know, I'm generalizing, and there might be some and some grants or whatever. I raised this question in a global crop diversity trust webinar that was being broadcast out of Rome this year and they had questions at the end and they just skipped over my question, which was how well funded are these institutions? Are they adequate to actually do the job? And nobody wants to answer that because they're not. And I'm, I'm sorry, was there a link to the seed saving list of non-patented seeds that you were putting together? Um, it is not up yet. So I have the list and it's a matter, and that's the next thing on my list at Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance. And so it will be the patent-free seed page at rockymountainseeds.org. Thank you. You answered more questions that I could even think of. Thank you, Bill, so much. And for the library and all the people that were helping run the meeting or the the production here. I learned a ton. Thank you, Cara, for coming on. Yeah. Well, thank you all for coming on a Saturday. Big well, thank you for doing all this work for all of us and, you know, sharing your information. I, I had no idea, like, yeah. the, the patent stuff going on. So it, really provide some motivation on some of the community things we've been doing anyways, you know, creating these community corridors for yes. pollinators and birds and um, getting people involved in growing food because my community has some, you know, just some discrepancies and challenges and things. So yeah. um, this is just to me, another thing that just, yeah, another thing to tack on to the whole process that we've been doing. So if, if we do grow, patented seeds or that have this utility patent technically then we're not allowed to grow them and then keep the seeds to share give away or exchange or trade and so basically we could be they could come after us for doing something like that is that the idea then that is that, that is yeah and so as dr oh. Bagley points out and this is one of the good news parts of it is that um they only have six years to do that so if you're doing it for more than six years and it's done in somewhat of an open way and you don't care what the consequences are and they don't come after you, at least that's the way it is now. You know, we know that the goalposts keep getting moved. <laughs> I mean, if there was a serious threat, but um, that's, you know, one of the things. And so, yeah, the whole patent seed thing is really, you know, and frankly, there are people that come to our seed schools that go, oh. That's exactly what I'm going to do. You know, um, Vanda Nashiva tells a story about how um, Monsanto had patented one of the varieties of rice 
that was one of their land races. Where a popular rice throughout India that was a land race that was now patented. No longer could Indian farmers for the first time grow and, and save their own seeds legally, right? They had to buy it. And so what they did at her uh, Nabdanya, um, she told me, is they, uh, they printed up 10,000 postcards and put little seed packets with this variety of rice on it, the patented variety, and they mailed them out to the farmers through their networks. They've got incredible networks there now. In fact, the New York Times just had a story about the Indian farmers that are still on strike there. And it's really a compelling and, and, and it's a story we should all understand because I think that's where we're going to be headed in the future. But anyway, they mailed out all these seeds. And what the postcard said was it was a, 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 an addressed postcard to a self-addressed stamped postcard to Monsanto. And it said, Monsanto, thank you very much for the rice seeds. We understand that these are patented, but we love them and we think that they're ours and we've grown them out. And now we have lots of the seeds and we're passing them out to everybody in our village. So thank you very much. And they dropped the patent. There was just no way they could fight hundreds of thousands of people on a grassroots level. So, uh, you know, that's just a story. So how we get from here to there, I don't know. For me, seed libraries are so important. And, and this deal that we've struck um, is, is important. And I'd like to see us, you know, stay above board and because we're gonna win anyway. Nobody's coming to save us, but nobody's gonna stop us is the other side of that. And so um, that's why it's just an interesting discussion. So, you know, yeah. I know Molly gets it at uh, Slow Food Prescott there and, um, and that would be a place and they've already talked about and we've done three seed schools there. There's a deep part in the community. If any place in Arizona gets it together and has its own seed bank and its own place, you know, that's really vibrant um, besides Tucson, it'll be Prescott. So, you know, you've got a lot of, uh, lot of momentum going there and I'm honored that I was asked to help do this again. So if we're growing out the patented seeds like generationally, technically, like, can we just say, what? Well, no, this is our own seed. It's not, <laughs> I mean. There are no seed know. naming police yet. <laughs> just tell okay. you that. I'm just, I'm just curious. The whole idea of this just seems so, uh, sorry. Yeah, I'm just, it just, yeah, I'm just kind of flabbergasted by the whole thing right now. I was thinking about going as a seed policeman for Halloween <laughs> and enforcing all the rules. <laughs> Never met one. Most state um, agriculture departments and their seed labs have no idea what to do at the grassroots level. They were never set up for that. It's all, all the agriculture in Arizona's history has been industrial besides indigenous, which they didn't count as real. So there's just no aware, they just have no idea. When they came and inspected me and my seed company here in Cornville, it was like, can I get my camera out and record all this and see how you do all this and your germ tests? And they were, they got, just in case we get another small seed company someday, we want to know, you know. And so I taught them how, you know, what was going on. I mean, it's just, so, so I'll just leave it at that. The, you know, we are at a good time. We're way down under the, the radar. We're part of the, what Paul Hawken calls blessed unrest <laughs> worldwide. This is happening. So, well, it's five o'clock. So. There's, there's a lot of good um, links in the chat box. Uh -huh. I wasn't able to copy and paste it out to like a Word doc just to keep the whole thing. I'm wondering if there's a way it archives when we do the recording. So Ruthie will be able to have access to it. So it'll, it'll be there. In yeah, she'll be able to have it and access it and make it available. Okay, cool. And Pe Peggy, if you need links and you can't find them, email me, all right? Okay. We're here to just, It's just so many, uh, just oh, yeah. hard no, to- I get it. Like to capture all of it. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> Thank you so much for everyone for coming and thank you especially Bill for being here and yeah. doing this presentation for us and sharing your knowledge. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you guys for doing it. And uh, hopefully we'll see each other soon. This whole uh, virus thing will subside enough that we can actually get together. It's always nice to have hugs at the end of school. So <laughs> take care. Yeah. Bye.